Hi everyone, I'm Professor Houston, and today we're going to be discussing the basic characteristics of bonds and why they're issued. So how am I going to do this? Well, I'm going to start off discussing what a bond is, and then I'll talk about the basic definitions we use when referring to bonds. Then I'll talk about what affects interest rates, and then finally we'll discuss the various types of short-term debt issuances that you see all the time in the bond market. When we talk about a bond, we're just referring to an agreement between two parties, a borrower and a lender, or sometimes a group of lenders, in which the lenders provide cash to the borrower in exchange for some future compensation. Bonds are a type of debt, and sometimes referred to as fixed income, meaning that the lenders are entitled to some specific compensation or income at fixed dates. Bonds can be issued by a variety of borrowers. Firms issue bonds to fund new capital budgeting projects, while governments issue bonds to cover budget shortfalls. There are also some cases throughout history where individuals have issued bonds. An example of this is the famous Bowie bond, in which the musician David Bowie issued bonds to investors who gave him cash in exchange for the future royalties on Bowie's music catalog. Now let's talk about the basic characteristics every bond has. When we mention the face value, we're referring to the amount the issuer or borrower pays to bondholders, who are sometimes called creditors or lenders. When we mention the face value, we're referring to the amount the issuer or borrower pays to the bondholders, who are sometimes called the creditors or lenders, when the bonds mature. The face value is sometimes referred to as the future value or the par value. Usually, the face value is $1,000 for corporate bonds and $100 for municipal bonds. The coupon is the regular payment the borrower makes to its bondholders every six months, every year, or sometimes every month. The coupon is determined by the coupon rate, which is reported when the bond is first issued. The coupon rate is the percentage of the face value that the borrower pays to the bondholders each year. For example, if a bond has a coupon rate of 5%, a face value of $1,000, and makes annual payments, it would be making annual coupon payments totaling $50. If that same bond made semi-annual coupon payments, then the borrower would need to pay its bondholders two semi-annual payments of $25 every six months. Next, we have the yield to maturity. The yield to maturity is what most people think of when they think of an interest rate on a bond. It represents the annualized return on the bond if that bond were going to be held to maturity. We'll calculate the yield to maturity in a later video. For now, you should know that the APR that's quoted by lenders is generally our yield to maturity. Now let's talk about how bonds are priced. The price of a bond is determined by its yield to maturity, the coupon payments, the time to maturity, and the other characteristics associated with the bond. We calculate the price of a bond in a straightforward manner by simply calculating the sum of the discounted value of the coupon payments to which the bondholders are entitled, and we add in the face value discounted to the present. Let's see this graphically. In this example, I've placed the timeline of cash flows. We have a series of coupons and the face value representing our cash flows. Notice that this bond makes a coupon payment every year, including the year that it matures. The face value is also paid in year four. To calculate the price of this bond, we discount all of the coupon payments and the face value of the bond back to the present at the yield to maturity using the time value of money formula. The sum of all those discounted future cash flows should be the price of the bond. There are some big differences between bonds and equity, or common stock. So let's talk about those differences. First, owning a bond does not give you an ownership interest in the company, unlike owning a share of common stock, which entitles you to a stake in the firm. Next, creditors, or lenders, or bondholders as they're sometimes known, generally have no voting rights. This means they can't vote on the members of the board of directors. They also have no say on any shareholder amendments that come up for a vote in the annual shareholder meeting. Next, bonds entitle bondholders to very specific payments over the life of the bond, namely the face value and any coupon payments. If the borrower fails to make those payments, the bondholder has the right to take the borrower to court to get compensation. Historically, this is what we consider technical default and it usually results in a renegotiation of the bond terms or the borrower filing some type of bankruptcy. Unlike bonds, ownership of stocks does not entitle a shareholder to dividends every period. 
Some firms choose not to pay any regular dividends. This means that firms that have raised capital entirely through stock issuances are more financially flexible than firms that issue a lot of debt. So you might wonder why a firm would issue bonds rather than stock in order to raise cash. Well, one of the most important reasons is because firms can deduct interest expenses that they pay their bondholders from their taxable income. This means that being more levered reduces a firm's tax liability. Now let's talk about why some bonds have different yields to maturity. There are many reasons why two bonds might have different yields to maturity, but the most likely explanation is because one of the bonds is more risky than the other. For example, if the government of Venezuela is issuing bonds and the U.S. government is issuing bonds, investors would require a higher interest rate to lend to the Venezuelan government because it's much more likely to default on those bonds than the U.S. government is. Another reason why some bonds have different yields to maturity is because some bonds come with covenants. We'll talk about bond covenants in a later video, but these are restrictions on the activity of the borrower that increase the likelihood that the lender will be paid what they're owed or something close to what they're owed. Bond covenants are mentioned in the bond indenture agreement, which is the agreement between the borrower and the lender, and it's signed when the bonds are first issued. If the bond comes with strong bond covenants, it's less likely that the borrower is going to default on its bonds, and therefore, this lower risk should allow the borrower to pay a lower yield to maturity to its lenders. Next, there are thousands of different characteristics that the bond can come with. Each of these can alter the riskiness of the bond, and thus its yield to maturity. In a later video, we'll go through some of the most common characteristics seen in corporate bonds. Finally, as we've already seen, the time to maturity can affect the yield to maturity. In most time periods, we have a normal yield curve, which means that the longer the maturity of the bond, the higher the yield to maturity. Since borrowers have more time to default on that bond and the interest rates have more time to fluctuate. Now let's talk about some of the most important short-term debt issuances. What you're looking at is a list of some of the most common money market securities. We refer to the money market as the market for any debt that has a maturity of one year or less. Some of the most well-known money market assets are U.S. T-bills, so let's start with them. A U.S. Treasury bill, or T-bill for short, is issued when the U.S. federal government needs to fund a budget shortfall. Given the size of the U.S. national debt, that shortfall is substantial, so there are a large number of T-bills outstanding at any one time. T-bills have five primary issuances, 4 weeks, 8 weeks, 13 weeks, 26 weeks, and 52 weeks. That corresponds to the 1-month, 2-month, 3-month, 6-month, and 1-year T-bills. T-bills are backed by the U.S. government. If you, as an investor, were to purchase a T-bill and the U.S. government were to default on it, the U.S. federal government would be in technical default, which would be one of the worst things that could happen to the U.S. economy. So, thankfully, this has never happened. The U.S. T-bill rate is sometimes what we consider the risk-free rate. It's an interest rate that you should expect to earn if you don't want to take any risk and still expect some return. If the U.S. federal government were to default on the national debt, the T-bill would no longer be our risk-free rate, and the yield to maturity demanded by investors would jump up tremendously, costing U.S. taxpayers trillions over the long run. I mentioned to you a few moments ago that there are a large number of T-bills outstanding at any one time. This is important because if you as an investor want to sell your T-bills on the secondary market to another investor, you would be able to sell your T-bills immediately for exactly what they should be worth. If you'd like to see how T-bills are sold or even buy some T-bills yourself directly from the U.S. federal government, then just go to the link that I've provided. I'll also provide that link in the comment section below. Let's take a look at who owns U.S. Treasury debt. Notice that about half the U.S. T-bills, T-notes, and T-bonds are owned by U.S. investors. A sizable percentage is owned by institutions like the Federal Reserve and state and local governments. Foreign governments also own a large number of Treasury securities. U.S. T-bills are a type of zero-coupon bond. Zero-coupon bonds are bonds that, as the name implies, make no coupon payments to the bondholder. If you buy one of these bonds, you buy it for a discount on the face value, and then over time, the value of the bond appreciates to the face value. Sometimes, we call these zero-coupon bonds zeros for short. Every zero is a pure discount loan, 
meaning that you pay less for the bond than you receive at maturity. Since I just mentioned zero coupon bonds, I think it's important to mention the other types of coupon bonds. Fixed coupon bonds are bonds that pay the same coupon payment every period. Variable coupon bonds are bonds that pay a coupon based on some base rate. The most common base rate is the LIBOR, which is something we'll talk about in a few minutes. The next type of asset we have in the money market is a certificate of deposit, or CD for short. CDs are assets that allow you to lock up a specific amount of money at a bank and earn interest on that money until the maturity date. The bank you buy the CD at invests your money at a slightly higher interest rate until maturity. If you want to see current rates on CDs, feel free to click the following link that I'll provide in the comments section if you're watching this on YouTube. Now let's talk about some other money market securities. First, we have commercial paper. Commercial paper is the short-term debt of blue-chip companies. Blue-chip companies are companies that are seen as industry leaders and are well-known brands. Examples of these are Coca-Cola, Berkshire Hathaway, and Apple. Commercial paper is issued by these firms to fund short-term cash shortfalls. Next, we have bankers' acceptances. And bankers' acceptances are sometimes referred to as something akin to post-dated checks. They are most frequently used to pay foreign suppliers in countries where the buyer has no credit. If a buyer is buying supplies from a supplier in a country where the buyer doesn't have a credit history, the buyer can lend the bank money. After the supplier delivers their goods, the bank transfers the agreed upon amount to the supplier. In essence, the foreign buyer with no credit in that country is substituting the bank's credit for their own in order to secure supplies. Finally, we have money market mutual funds. Money market mutual funds are similar to other mutual funds since they manage a portfolio of assets. The defining characteristic of money market mutual funds is that their portfolio consists entirely of short-term assets like T-bills, CDs, and commercial paper. Money market mutual funds diversify their portfolio across a large number of assets. Usually these securities have an average time to maturity of less than 90 days. If you'd like to see an example of these, let's take a look at one of them that I have listed here. I'm just going to click our link, and we're going to take a look at the Vanguard Prime Money Market Fund. So this is a money market mutual fund that's offered by Vanguard, which is a fund manager. So here we have a description of Vanguard's money market fund. Over here, it states that we are looking at a, an asset in the money market. Our expense ratio is the cost to investors every year for owning shares of this money market mutual fund. So 0.16% means that you're paying Vanguard 16 basis points a year, every year, as long as you're invested in this money market mutual fund. And you have to invest a minimum of $3,000. Now, we can also take a look at what this money market mutual fund holds. So if we look down here, you can see that this money market mutual fund has 6.6% of its assets in certificates of deposit, 9.4% uh, of its assets in U.S. government obligations, that's uh, some, probably something like TIPS, 27.2% uh, in U.S. T-bills, which we've already talked about. So that's that. And over here we have the weighted average life or time to maturity of the assets in this money market mutual funds portfolio, 79 days. All right, so let's go back to our PowerPoint. Next, we have Euro dollars. Euro dollars are deposit accounts overseas where investors deposit US dollars. The reason these are important is because some foreign investors might not want to hold their home currency, especially if that currency is depreciating rapidly. Investors in countries like Turkey, Brazil, Venezuela, and Zimbabwe, just to name a few, invest heavily in euro dollars if they can. The name is a bit of a misnomer though. An investor can invest in these accounts regardless of whether they're in Europe or outside of Europe. Finally, we have repurchase agreements, or repos for short. Repos are securities backed by the U.S. federal government in which a broker-dealer or broker agrees to buy T-bills today and sell them back at a later date for a certain price. 
Dealers that buy repos are making a bet that they can't get a better return with a similarly risky asset over the same period. Now let's talk about the Fed funds rate. I know that we discussed this in one of our previous lectures, but I just want to mention it again with the money market securities. The Fed funds rate is the rate that the Federal Reserve targets in order to increase or decrease interest rates as a whole in the broader U.S. economy. The Fed buys or sells U.S. Treasuries to drive this rate up or down to suit its needs. The effective Fed funds rate is the rate at which banks lend to each other overnight. If the Fed funds rate rises, the rates banks charge to their customers will rise as well, since banks will transfer the cost on to their customers. If you'd like to see how the Fed funds rate adjusts, please see one of my other videos on interest rates or the cost of money. Another rate that you should know about is the London Interbank Offered Rate, or LIBOR for short. LIBOR is a term for a series of rates of various maturities, and LIBOR is calculated as the average of a survey in which London bankers report the rate that they believe they could get on a loan from another bank in London. There's a three-month LIBOR, a six-month LIBOR, and a lot of other LIBORs of other maturities. And LIBOR is going to be reported every single day. You can look up LIBOR with various maturities daily. Now, the reason LIBOR is important is because it's used as the base rate in a lot of variable interest rate loans. If the LIBOR increases, then the interest payment you would pay if you had a variable interest rate loan would likely increase. Usually, if you have one of these loans, you pay LIBOR plus a percentage, like 2% or 3%. So, for example, today, the three-month LIBOR rate, or this week, it's 2.74%. Last year, it was 1.79%. If you had a variable interest rate loan and it charged you 2% beyond the three-month LIBOR, that means that your coupon payment or your interest payment on that loan would likely be 4.74%. All right, let's go back to our slides. All right, so that's pretty much it. Uh, we do have one final topic, and that is the TED spread. And the TED spread is nothing more than the difference between the LIBOR of a certain maturity and the T-bill rate with the same maturity. The TED spread is one of our best measures of market uncertainty because we're looking at the difference between a risky interest rate and our risk-free rate. The wider the TED spread is, the more uncertain investors are about market conditions. So to illustrate this, I'm going to click on this, and this will take us to the Federal Reserve's FRED database, which is a data repository that the St. Louis Fed uh, maintains. It reports all kinds of macroeconomic data. So here we have the TED spread, and it's essentially the spread or the difference between LIBOR and the uh, T-bill rate. Now I'm going to expand this out, I will say, out to 2005. And you can see what happens to the TED spread during periods of market uncertainty. So here we go. During the financial crisis, which is essentially this period here, the TED spread jumped up, meaning that the LIBOR, or the rate that banks were charging each other during the height of the financial crisis, was very high, and the T-bill rate was extremely low. Essentially, there was a gap that formed between these two rates, which is what we generally see in periods of great market uncertainty. This gray area just indicates that we were in a uh, recessionary period. All right, let's wrap up. So what did we cover? Well, we talked about the fact that bonds are issued by a variety of institutions and sometimes individuals to raise cash for a variety of purposes. Bond prices are determined by the yield to maturity, the coupon payments, time to maturity, and other factors. We also mentioned that many short-term debt issuances, like T-bills, are sold at a discount to the face value. This is because these issuances do not make coupon payments. Finally, there's a wide variety of short-term debt issuances. With that, I'll conclude, and I'll see you on the next video.